I'm going to ask you to please open your Bible to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18. This morning, um, I would call what we, uh, what we did this morning a little bit more of a sermon. Tonight, it's going to be more like a Bible study. I don't know what you usually do um, on a Wednesday night, but this would be uh, similar to a Bible study for a Wednesday night service but I believe it's what the Lord would have us to do tonight. So we're going to use, I'm saying all that to say we're going to use our Bible quite a bit tonight, but we're going to be in the book of Matthew the whole time. So if you'll just go to the book of Matthew and turn to to chapter 18, we'll begin in chapter 18 and we'll look at several different passages here in the book of Matthew. Most all of you know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that's a suburb of Jerusalem, that's down in the uh, southern part of the kingdom of, of uh, Israel. And then he grew up in a town called Nazareth. That's up in the northern part of the uh, nation of Israel. But when he became an adult, in fact, the Bible says when he heard that John the Baptist had been arrested at that time after Jesus had become an adult, he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And he was living there in Capernaum. It's a little fishing village. It's on the northwest uh, coast of the Sea of Galilee. I've taken uh, five uh, groups to Israel to, 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 to tour uh, the, Israel. And uh, my favorite place to go is the uh, t- town of Capernaum. It's, it's been excavated. Uh, they found Peter's house. They found the house that Matthew lived. They, they think that within two or three houses of the house that Matthew lived in, etc. And the reason I like going there is because when you're in Capernaum, you actually know that you're walking on exactly the same spots where Jesus walked. You know for sure you're exactly where he was. But uh, Jesus and some of his disciples were living there in Capernaum, and they would often leave the city and go on a tour to go preaching in different villages, just like I'm here this week. And on one of those trips, they were coming back from the preaching tour, and the story is told in more than one of the Gospels, and if you read each account of this particular story, in one of the stories, it uses the word disputing. The disciples, if you can believe this, they were actually stepping in the footprints of Jesus Christ. I mean, they were literally putting their sandals in his footprints and they were behind him, following him home after watching him preach. And what were they talking about? (laughs) They were disputing about which one of them was the greatest. They sound kind of like us, don't they? (laughs) And then we pick up the story in chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time, at the same time is referring to when they got back to to Capernaum. So at the same time they returned to Capernaum, came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now if you look at me just for a second, don't don't, don't get deceived here. If you just read chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, you think, oh, these disciples are talking about someday when we get to heaven, you know, who's going to be the greatest and, and, and we're going to worship God. And, but that's not what the, the... They've been back there arguing about which one of them was the greatest. And so now the one of them gets brazen enough to go to Jesus and say, which one of us is the greatest? All right, let's continue reading. Verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child, in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he uh, were drowned in the depth of the sea. So you notice there when this, this, these disciples came to Jesus and asked, which one of us is the greatest? He brought a little child there and, 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 he, and he, he spoke uh, of, the, of the children and, and he mentioned five times, five times a little child as little children this little child, one such little child, these little ones. Then in verses 7 through 9, Jesus warns that offenses must come. What he's saying is, we live among humans, all of us do, and humans are sinful, every one of us are, and so somebody's going to get offended. 
Anytime you get a group of people together for any reason, a family reunion, to go to work, to go to church, to go to school, it doesn't matter. Somebody, he said that they must come. Offenses must come. It's, it's going to happen. But he said, woe be to the one who offends one of these little ones. All right, now let's continue reading verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. If you'll notice there in verse 11, very familiar phrase, the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. One of the most familiar phrases in the New Testament other than maybe John 3.16. But notice it says, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That word for means it's referring back to what we just read. And what did we just read? We'll look back at verse 10 if you would. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. So this famous statement, this one of the most familiar statements in the New Testament, he's still talking about these little ones. He has been all this time, and he still is. All right now, if you would look at verse 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Now here we have another very familiar passage, one of the most familiar stories in the New Testament. Every one of us have heard the story ever since we were a little child. A farmer had a hundred sheep. He took them up in the mountain to feed them. He brought them back. He put them in the corral. He counted them as they went in. One was missing. He left them in the corral. He went back up on the mountain. He found the sheep. He brought it home. His neighbors came over. They rejoiced with him. We've all heard the story. It's very familiar to us. Now, let's continue reading, if you would, in verse 14. Even so, now those words, even so, is, uh, are like the word for in verse 11. Even so means what we're about to read refers back to what we just read. We just read the story of the farmer with the sheep. Even so, it is the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these, I'm sorry, even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So even this familiar story about the farmer, he's still talking about the little ones. Then in verses 15 through 22, one of the disciples tries to change the subject. He says, yeah, but what if I get offended? How many times should I forgive the person who offends me? And you know, trying to sound pious, he says, should I do it seven times? What he's doing, he's trying to divert the attention. He's trying to change the subject. Jesus has been warning them, be careful that you don't offend somebody. Well, he tries to change the subject and say, well, yeah, but what if I get offended? And he says, should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus says, no, how about 70 times seven? And then Jesus gets them right back on the subject. Now we come to verses 23 through 35. I'm not going to read the entire passage because of time. But if you look at me real quick, I'll explain to you. There's another story here. Now, this story is not quite as familiar as the story about the farmer with the sheep. In this story, there is a king, and this king had some servants who owed him some money. And the king decided that he needed to collect some of that money. So he calls the first servant in, and he agree, they agree on the amount. And in our currency today, it would have been about $15,000 that this servant owed the king. So the king says, I need you to pay me the $15,000. The servant says, uh, I don't have it. I can't pay you right now. The king says, okay, then I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell your wife. I'm going to sell all your children. I'm going to sell all your possessions. And I'm going to repay myself some of the debt that you owe me. Well, the man is distraught over the fact that his family is going to be uh, separated. So he falls on the ground and begins to worship the king and he begs him, Oh, king, please give me a little more time. I promise I'll raise the money and pay you. And the king, the Bible doesn't tell us why, but for some reason the king decides to have compassion and he says to the man, You know what? I'm not just going to give you some more time. I'm going to forgive the whole debt. You don't owe me a penny. You're free. You can leave. Wow. 
Can you imagine how the guy feels? He's going to keep his family. He's no longer in debt. He gets up and he walks out. And I'm going to say apparently there were some other servants waiting in line, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the first servant walks out, and he sees a second servant, and the first servant says to the second servant, hey, aren't you that guy that owes me some money? He says, yes, I am, and they agree on the amount. And in our currency today, it would have been about 15 cents that the man owed him. And the Bible uses clear terminology. It says he reached out and immediately grabbed him by the neck and demanded that he pay the 15 cents right now. And the man said, I don't have it. I'll get it and give it to you later. And he said, I, I'm not waiting. And he threw the man in the debtor's prison. Back then they had a particular prison that uh, if you didn't pay your debt, you had to go to prison. And by the way, it wasn't a prison like we have today with color TV and air conditioning and a workout room and internet and so forth. No, in that prison, they didn't even feed you unless your family brought you some food to eat and you stayed in the prison until the family could raise the money to get you out. And he throws him in the debtor's prison. And here's when I, why I say apparently they were waiting in line because now a third and a fourth servant walk in before the king and they say to the king, king, you won't believe what we just saw out there. You know that guy you forgave $15,000? He found somebody that owed him 15 cents and he threw him in prison. The king was furious. Look at verse 34, if you would, please. In verse 34, it says, And his Lord was wroth, or furious, or very angry, and delivered him to the tormentors, not the normal prison where you put criminals, the prison where they torture people till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now, what was the king so upset about? Was he upset about the $15,000? No, it wasn't the $15,000 he was upset about. He had already decided he could do without the $15,000. What he was so upset about was that he had given forgiveness to this man and that man was not willing to take that forgiveness and pass it on to somebody else you know every one of us who are here tonight that have been saved that know our sins are forgiven we know we're on our way to heaven we heard the news of forgiveness either directly or indirectly through the effort of some local church uh, the pastor came and knocked on your door and you came to church and got saved. Or the Sunday school teacher invited you to church and she won you to Christ. Or a bus captain picked you up and brought you to church. Or someone gave you a tract that the church printed and paid for it and, and gave it to you and you read that and got saved. Or maybe you went to a revival meeting like we're having this week. Or maybe you went to vacation Bible school. Or maybe you went to summer camp with the church. Or maybe you even heard an evangelist preaching on the radio that a church helped sponsor his ministry. Ministry, but either directly or indirectly, every one of us heard the news of forgiveness through the effort of some local church. Now, here's my question. What did it cost that local church to get the news of forgiveness to you? Well, first of all, it cost the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible said the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. But not only the blood of Jesus Christ, there have been martyrs all down through the centuries that have shed their blood so you and I could hear the news of forgiveness. My father was uh, in the 82nd Airborne uh, in World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, front line, hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was in the crossing of the Ruhr River and some other uh, campaigns. And so what I've done now... Uh, 12 different times, I've taken a group of our college students and I've gone to Europe with them and my father went with us the first nine times we went and we toured the things that my father did in, in World War II. And that was in Belgium and Germany and in France and then when we finish, we always go down through Austria into Switzerland and we spend the last three days in the Swiss Alps. And I always say the college kids that want to get to go skiing in the Swiss Alps. And all of us old people go on a horse-drawn sleigh ride. <laughs> and, and, and then but, but when we're done and we start home, we always fly home from Zurich. And downtown Zurich, there's a plaque on the wall on a building down by the river, down in the old section of town. And on that plaque, it commemorates that spot as the place where they used to take the Baptists 
you know, they had the established church back then, and you got baptized, legally baptized into that when you were six weeks old. And if you got caught being what they called re-baptized, when you grew up and got saved, and if you wanted to join a Baptist church, that was against the law. And if you did that and they caught you, they would tie you to a pole, they would swivel you out over the river, they would dunk you down in the river, and they would hold you there until you almost drowned. They would jerk you up, let you get a quick breath of air, stick you back under the water, hold you there till you almost drown, jerk you back up. What they were doing is they were mocking the fact that these people had been what they called re-baptized. And they would do that over and over until the person drowned. Then they'd swing the pole back over by the bank and cut the ropes loose and let the body float down the river so the family couldn't recover the body. They would tie another Baptist on the pole and do it all over again. Do you know that some of that kind of stuff happened right here in America? Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about uh, uh, when we were the original 13 colonies. Not, not, not you know, uh, before we became the United States of America. You know, it was illegal. <laughs> it was illegal to get baptized into a Baptist church in some of the colonies right here in America. Right here in America, there were people, before we were called United States of America, there were people in this country that we live in today that were arrested and tortured in prison. And we know of at least two cases that are documented where someone, where a Baptist died under the torture uh, uh, imposed upon them right here in America for committing the crime of getting baptized into a Baptist church. Do you know that some of that kind of stuff is still happening in the world today? I mean, we've seen it on the news, Syria and Egypt and other places. Just a few years ago, our graduate, Brother Kevin Wynn, that I mentioned in the service this morning, who pastors in Mexico City, some men from his church, Brother Kevin Wynn and some men from his church, went to a little village up in the mountains just outside Mexico City, and they had a revival meeting Monday through Friday night. And then Friday night, they baptized everybody who had gotten saved during the revival, and they started a Baptist church there in that village. Saturday morning, Brother Wynn and the men in his church went back to Mexico City to conduct their services on Sunday. And Saturday night, the Catholic priest there in that little village organized some of the other men in the village. And they went to the homes of two of the men who had been baptized Friday night about midnight Saturday night. They drug them outside the village and hacked them to death with their machetes. That happened in mine in your lifetime one country over from where we live. Somebody paid a debt for me and you to hear the news of forgiveness. Now you and I owe a debt to pass that news of forgiveness on to somebody else. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, there was a little boy by the name of Richard White who grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, in a poor neighborhood down by the river. And there was a, a little Baptist mission down there uh, called the Levy Baptist Mission, down by the levee of the river. And Richard lived at home with his mother the, alone, just the two of them. And, uh, and one summer, they were going to take the junior age boys and girls to camp. But Richard couldn't afford to go. So the bus captain from that little church paid Richard's way to go to camp. And Richard got saved at junior camp. He came home the next Sunday and got baptized. By the time he graduated from high school, he had been called to preach. So he went to Bible college there in Shreveport, Louisiana. When he graduated from Bible college, he came about 10 miles out into the country and he became the pastor of a little Baptist church. And that church auditorium was about as big as the first uh, oh, about five rows of this section. That was the whole auditorium in that little church. But that little church had one bus. And that one bus came by my house and picked me up and took me to church. And the first time I rode that bus, I got saved. The second time I rode that bus and went to church, I uh, got baptized. The third time I went to that church, I was called to preach. About four months later, the bus captain had to move away. And so I was only 15 years old. I'd only been saved four months. But they asked me to be the bus captain of the route. So I became the bus captain. 
About a year later, by that time we had three bus routes, so they asked me, by, I had, it was a little over a year later, I had just turned 17, they asked me to be the bus director, so now I had three bus routes. I remember I went to my father one Saturday. I was the only one in my family who went to church. But my, I went to my father on a Saturday and I said, Dad, one of my drivers has to work tomorrow. Would you drive his bus for me one Sunday? He said, well, okay, son, I'll drive that bus for you one Sunday. The next Saturday I went back to my dad and I said, Dad, one of my other drivers has to go out of town tomorrow for a funeral. Would you drive his bus for me one Sunday? He said, okay, son, I'll drive that bus for you one Sunday. The next Saturday, three Saturdays in a row, I went back to him and I said, Dad, my driver got to uh, move to a different town. Uh, his company transferred him and I need a driver on my route uh, tomorrow. Would you drive my bus one Sunday until I can find another driver? He said, okay, son, I'll drive that bus for you one Sunday. And he did. He drove that bus one Sunday at a time for 26 years. <laughs> and after he had been driving the bus for about two and a half years, he got saved. My dad and I worked on that route together all the, all the time I was in high school before I left to go to college. And then the Sunday after I left to go to college, he was eating lunch with my mother, and my mother said, his name was Theo, she said, Theo, what's the matter? He said, you know, I don't know what's the matter. He said, when Ray was here, we had lots of kids on the bus. We averaged 17. That was a lot to dad. And he said, but today I drove the bus down the same streets and stopped in front of the same houses, and only three kids came. Well, you know what happened. Nobody visited the route on Saturday. My mom didn't want my dad to be discouraged, so she said, well, you know, I teach in the uh, uh, grade school, uh, public grade school. She said, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go out next Saturday. I know where all the kids live around here. I'll see if I can get some of them to ride the bus for you. Six weeks later, my mom had 83 on that bus. Richard White paid his debt. My dad paid his debt. I won my mom to Christ. She paid her debt. Your pastor and his wife are trying to pay their debt. The question tonight is this. Are you and I paying our debt to take that news of forgiveness and pass it on to someone else? Jesus and his disciples had been up there in the northern part of the kingdom in that area called Galilee. They left there and they went down to the southern part of the kingdom to an area called Judea. Would you look in chapter 19, and I want to show you something that happened in chapter 19 when they were down there in the southern part of the kingdom called Judea. Chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, if you look at verse 13. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them, rebuked the ones who brought the little children. But, but Jesus said... Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Somehow, when the disciples had been up there in Galilee with Jesus, and they heard him say, except you be converted and become as little children. And they heard him say, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, somehow they just didn't get it. It went right over their head. What he was trying to say is this. The best way to get saved is for you to be like a little child. Now why would he say that? Well, what do you have to do to get saved? The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever joins the church can go to heaven. That's not what it says, is it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever gets baptized, they get to go to heaven. That's not what it says, is it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should... Oh, believeth. Who's the most likely to believe what you tell them? A little child. They haven't been disappointed as many times as you and I have been, and they're more likely to believe it. And he said to the disciples, he was trying to teach the disciples to, to, to uh, the, the best time to get the news of forgiveness to somebody is as soon as possible. <laughs> Don't let them get any older. Get to them as quick as you can and tell them this news of forgiveness. Now, while they were down there in the southern part of the kingdom, they also went to the capital city, Jerusalem. So would you turn to chapter 21, and I want to show you what happened while the, Jesus and the disciples were in Jerusalem. In chapter 21, I'm going to begin with verse 14. 
chapter 21, verse 14 says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. So this is Jesus Christ himself, the very Son of God of all places, in the temple, in the holy city. He's healing people. And verse 15, And when the chief priests and scribes, the religious leaders, those that had been in the church or the temple for a long time, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, that Jesus did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were sore displeased. Would you look at me just for a moment? These religious leaders, these men that had been in the temple or the church for a long time, they got upset because when Jesus healed somebody, the children started crying out. They said, praise the Lord. They said, glory to God. It might have been their daddy that got healed. It might have been their uncle, their brother. I don't know. But, but uh, they, they got upset because these children were disrupting their worship service. You know, there were churches all over America this morning that had services that they called a praise and worship service. <laughs> and I'm not saying none of those people are saved. And I'm not saying none of those people are sincere. <laughs> but I'm saying that when, Je when, when, the, when Jesus was healing these people and these little children started up uh, 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 disturbing their worship service, <laughs> they got upset. One Sunday morning at our church, the First Baptist Church of Hammond, we had two little boys, they were brothers, one was nine and one was 11. They rode a bus from the next town over from Hammond called East Chicago, East Chicago, Indiana. And they rode the bus that morning and they came to church and they were supposed to go to junior church like the bus kids do, but somehow they got away from their bus captain. Ours is a large church and they sneaked away from their bus workers and they made it into the main auditorium. And you know, Brother Richard, anytime bus kids get away from their bus workers and come to the main auditorium, they never sit on the back row. <laughs> These two little boys were sitting right up here on the front row by themselves. And that Sunday morning, Brother Hiles was preaching, First Baptist Church, big First Baptist Church, downtown Hammond, 4,500 seat auditorium, packed full every Sunday morning. The mayor often comes to the, uh, came to the service back then. And uh, Brother Hiles was telling the story of the lost battalion in World War I. You know, they didn't have radios back then. And a group of Americans, American battalion, got cut off behind enemy lines. They were surrounded by the Germans. And they didn't have a radio, so nobody knew who they were. For three or four days, they became known as the Lost Battalion. Well, they had a homing pigeon, and they put a note on the homing pigeon's foot, and they threw it in the air, and that homing pigeon was supposed to fly back to its home base at the headquarters and with that note on there that letting the people know where they were and uh, Brother Hiles was telling the story he had the whole crowd right in the palm of his hand everybody's sitting on the edge of the pew listening to the story he said the pigeon was flying through the air the Germans were shooting at it and one bullet might have clipped its wing but the pigeon kept on flying and another bullet might have clipped his foot but the pigeon kept on flying and about that time that little nine year old boy jumped up on the pew he whistled as loud as he could and his 11 year old brother hollered go pigeon <laughs> and that's exactly what they got upset about let's look and see what happened verse 16 and said unto him hearest thou what these say what these children say these scribes and Pharisees were upset and, and they were, they, they, uh, uh, they, they, were, they said to Jesus, did you hear what those kids said? And Jesus saith unto them, yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. Sure, there were churches this morning that had a praise and worship service. And there's nothing wrong with those of us that have been saved for 20 or 30 or 40 years. I've been saved 50 years. This is my 50th anniversary as a Christian this year. And, and there's nothing wrong with us getting together and singing the praises of God. And I love your song service here. I recognize the songs. I love, I love that. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said if you want to perfect your praise, add to it the praise of a babe in Christ. He said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou, thou hast 
perfected praise. Sure, I can praise the Lord, but is there anybody praising the Lord with me that I won to Christ lately? Is there anybody praising the Lord with me that I brought to church? Is there anybody praising the Lord that I gave a track to? Is there anybody praising the Lord that I influenced to get back into church? He, it, 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 and Jesus said to these, uh, these, these uh, scribes and, and priests, he, he said, if you want to perfect your praise, add to it the praise of some little ones that have gotten saved recently. Let's continue reading. And he left them. Jesus left those in the, in the temple and went out of the city into Bethany and he lodged there. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God of all places in the temple, healing people, and all of a sudden he stopped because of those Pharisees, those scribes and priests got upset because the children were disrupting the service. And Jesus turned around and walked out. I wonder who the next person was in line to get healed that didn't get healed. He stayed gone overnight. He came back to the temple the next day. He tried again to teach, and when he did, the Sadducees argued with him. Then the Pharisees argued with him. Then the scribes argued with him again. Then the priest argued with him again. And now if you'll turn one last place to chapter 23. Jesus is back in the, in the temple again. He has been trying to teach and they've been arguing with him. And he says in verse 37, Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, I can almost hear the frustration in his voice. Now, I know it may be sacrilegious to accuse deity of being frustrated, but in his human voice, I can almost hear the frustration as he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered, there it is again, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye, who's he talking to? Scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders, and ye would not. Now, whether you understand this or not, I have heard of your church for many years. Uh, Brother Peslak was here and back before that even and, 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 I, and, I, and I know a little bit about your church the first time I've ever been here but I understand that I'm preaching to some folks today who have won many folks to Christ I understand that I'm preaching to some folks who have passed out a lot of tracts I understand I'm preaching to some folks tonight who have brought many visitors to church but can I ask you this question is there any possibility that when you and I get to heaven Jesus Christ is going to look at me and say, I would have gathered together your uncle, your cousin, your neighbor, your co-worker, your uh, clerk at the grocery store, but ye would not pass out that track. Ye would not come to the Saturday morning Great Commission meeting. Ye would not go to the effort to go to the uh, uh, soul winning class. Ye would not invite some visitors to church. Ye would not. Okay, can, can, is, is there somebody on your mind right now? When I said, when I get to heaven, God might say to me, were you thinking, yeah, God might say to me, and did you think of somebody? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's what they ask. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who has the greatest compassion and puts forth the greatest effort to get the next person the news of forgiveness. But who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's not the issue. The issue is not which one of us is the greatest. The issue is not, did you win one more than I did? The issue is not, uh, are you a better Christian than me? The issue is not, which one of us is the greatest? The issue is, who is the next person we can get the news of forgiveness to? Every one of us knows somebody. Everybody sitting in this room tonight knows somebody 
that was not in church this morning. Everybody sitting in this room tonight knows somebody that as far as you know, they're not saved yet. Everybody sitting in this room tonight knows somebody who used to attend this church that probably won't be at the meeting tomorrow night unless somebody encourages them to come. It's up to me and you to get the news of forgiveness to the next person. Saved person that needs forgiveness or lost person who needs forgiveness. They need the news of forgiveness. It's mine and your job to pay our debt to pass it on to somebody else. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed. Tonight I'd like to ask this question that I've already asked. Can you think of someone right this minute that should have been in church tonight that's not? Can you think of somebody right this minute who should have been in church this morning who was not? Can you think of somebody right this minute that you don't know if they're saved or not? Or maybe you do know that they're not saved. Who would say right now, Brother Young, Yes, you're right, I can think of someone, and most of us can think of some ones, more than one. And you would say, Brother Young, tonight I want to make a fresh commitment. Tonight I want to make a fresh vow to God that I'm going to get back in there and start doing my part or continue to do my part or even do more than I've been doing about getting that news of forgiveness to the next person. What is it God wants you to do? Does He want you to come to the Great Commission meeting on Saturday? Does He want you to be in the soul winning class? Does He want you to invite your neighbor or your friend? Does He want you to take some tracks and pass them out this week? Uh, does He want you to get a CDL license and offer to drive a bus for the church? Does He want you to volunteer to work in a Sunday school class or a junior church or a nursery? What is it God would have you to do? Is He speaking to you tonight? Who would say tonight, Brother Young, yes, I can think of someone or some ones that need the news of forgiveness. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray with you about that person? You know of someone. Keep your hand up just for a moment. Thank you. You may put it down. Father, many of us raised our hands. Mine's up too. I pray tonight that you'll help us to renew our passion, to renew our willingness to just get out there and start doing more of what we know to do or continue to diligently study and learn on how to do it. I know some are going through that right now. I pray, Father, that you will make a difference in my life and in the lives of everyone sitting in this room tonight that we will be willing to pass on the news of forgiveness. Help us tonight to make some vows, some commitments to exactly what we're going to do who we're going to talk to, when we're going to talk to them, uh, who we're going to take with us to help us if we need that, if we need the pastor or somebody to go with us, which class we're going to attend, which meeting we're going to come to. Help us to make some specific vows tonight. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, could I ask you to please stand at this time?